नमो भगवच वासुदेवाय ओम नमो भगवच वासुदेवाय ओम नमो भगवच वासुदेवाय Shrimad Bhagavatam, Canto 3, Chapter 23, Text 1, Translation and Commentary by His Divine Grace A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada. Maitreya Uvacha, Pitribhyam Prasthite Sadhvi, Patim Ingita Kovida, Nityam Parya Charat Pritya. Bhavaniva Bhavam Prabhum Maitreya continued After the departure of her parents the chaste woman Devahuti who could understand the desires of her husband served him constantly with great love as Bhavani the wife of Lord Shiva serves her husband Purport the specific example of Bhavani is very significant. Bhavani means the wife of Bhava or Lord Shiva. Bhavani or Parvati, the daughter of the king of the Himalayas, selected Lord Shiva who appears to be just like a beggar as her husband. In spite of her being a princess, she undertook all kinds of tribulations to associate with Lord Shiva who did not even have a house but was sitting underneath the trees and passing his time in meditation. Although Bhavani was the daughter of a very great king she used to serve Lord Shiva just like a poor woman. Similarly Devahuti was the daughter of an emperor Swayam Bhuvaman yet she preferred to accept Karda Muni as her husband. She served him with great love and affection and she knew how to please him. Therefore, she is designated here as Sadvi, which means a chaste, faithful wife. Her rare example is the ideal of Vedic civilization. Every woman is expected to be as good and chaste as Devahuti or Bhavani. Today in Hindu society, Unmarried girls are still taught to worship Lord Shiva with the idea that they may get husbands like him. Lord Shiva is the ideal husband, not in the senses of riches or sense gratification, but because he is the greatest of all devotees. Vaishnavanam yatha Shambhu. Shambhu, or Lord Shiva, is the ideal Vaishnav. He constantly meditates upon Lord Ram and chants, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Lord Shiva has a Vaishnav Sampradaya which is called the Vishnu Swami Sampradaya. Unmarried girls worship Lord Shiva so that they can expect a husband who is as good a Vaishnav as he. The girls are not taught to select a husband who is very rich or very opulent for material sense gratification. Rather, if a girl is fortunate to get a husband as good as Lord Shiva in devotional service, then her life becomes perfect. The wife is dependent on the husband and, the, and if the husband is a Vaishnav then naturally she shares the devotional service of the husband because she renders him service. The reciprocation of service and love between husband and wife. This reciprocation of service and love between husband and wife is the ideal of a householder's life. Here Devahuti is referred to as Sadvi which Prabhupada translates as a chaste, faithful wife and she is compared to Bhavani. They're actually, as Prabhupada points out in the purport, from a similar background that both were the daughters of great kings who chose to marry a poor person, or in the case of Lord Shiva, he's Parameshwar, supreme controller within the material sphere, but he chose to live as a poor person, but who was rich with the wealth of love of Krishna. 
So they both forswore material opulences to gain spiritual opulences and therefore they are described as sadvi. Sadvi is the female form of the word sadhu. And sadhu means one who is sat, one who is concerned with the that which is good, that which is beneficial for himself and for others. The word sadhu can refer to grihastas, if the grihasta is a saintly person. Sadhu Prabhupada usually translates as saintly person. But is generally it's not exclusively, but generally, it, when we think of a sadhu, we think of a renounced male, one who is living, what is that? Asakta Anabhishvanga Putra Dara Grihadishu, who is living detached from any connection with sons, wife, and home. But generally when we say sadhu, it's just like in the census. They, when they make the census in India, they, one category is sadhus. They put together with beggars, beggars and sadhus. So it's considered a sadhu is someone who has no income and he's no family. So a sadhu, like I said, definitely, Bhaktuno Thako, greatest sadhu. But he was living in household life most of his life. But generally the understanding is that someone who is renounced from material affairs. So Bhaktuno Thako, he was also renounced, but his, of course, otherwise how could we call him a sadhu? But externally he appeared to be a householder attached to this material world. So sadhu generally means one who is renounced, a male. But sadhvi, the female form of the word, sadhvi is not, doesn't mean a sannyasini. Sadhvi means who is like Devahuti, Sita Devi, Bhavani, who is the chaste and faithful follower of her husband. Now there have been, we, we find in the history of spiritual India, that there are some women who have rena have been renunciates, brahmacharinis. There are some examples, Gargi, was a, we find in the Upanishads, Gargi, one Brahmacharini, was giving questions to Yagya Valkya. And in Gorya Vaishnav history, there are the two Sadvis. Well, actually, no, just that, actually, that one is there, that Ganga Mata Goswamini, who one is, she is famous, how she, she was actually also from very rich background, but she left her home and lived very austere life in Vrindavan and later became guru of several people in Puri. But they are the exceptions. Just like sadhu, generally we think of as a renounced person, but there may be a householder sadhu also. So, sadhvi has a different dharma. How to be saintly in the body of a woman is a different set of rules to follow. Of course, saintliness, that can be understood in terms of one's devotion to Krishna. There's no other meaning to saintliness. But, in terms of how one prosecutes his devotional service to Krishna. 
there's a big difference between the norm for men and the norm for women. Even though the soul is by nature the same, but there is a different dharma. Therefore we have Brahma dharma, Raja dharma, the dharma of Brahmanas, Kshatriyas. These are described extensively in Shastra. Vaishya dharma not explained very much. And Shudra dharma is summed up. Pariya, pari, what is that? Hmm? Pariya, Pariya charyatmakam karyam shudra karma svabhavajam. The same word is given here. Pariya charat, another form of the same word. Service. Shudra performs service to the higher castes. And stri also, there is one stri dharma. There is not one stri dharma for brahmanas, another for kshatriya. Brahmani, kshatriyani, but the same dharma, which is to serve the husband. And then she's considered sadri. We find in Mahabharata how one sadri was more powerful than a sadhu. That there was one sadhu who was meditating under a tree and the bird passed stool on him so he became angry and the bird just fell down dead and he thought well I'm a pretty good sadhu I just became angry at the bird and it dropped dead so I must be getting some shakti anyway to make a long story short he uh, after some time he wasn't under the tree he went to the city to beg and he first of all came and uh, knocked on the door and the housewife came out and she said, just wait a little time, I'm serving my husband. And he started to get angry again. And she saw him getting angry and said, don't think I'm a bird that you can just kill with your anger. He said, what? <laughs> so after some time she came back after serving her husband. And he said, how did you know about that incident with the bird? He said, because I'm serving my husband. You get power by doing tapasya, I get power by serving my husband. More than you, it seems. She wasn't afraid of his anger. So different rules and completely different outlook on life. The whole Vedic culture is a completely different has a completely different outlook on life to that of the modern materialistic society. Now all over the world, it's and very much in India, it's very much being promoted that women should be the same as men or more. They should be space astronauts. They should be heads of companies. They should go to Iraq and fight wars. No joke. So they're doing American soldieresses. They're fighting, and you're not allowed to say that everyone should look. Or you, know, you have to. You can't say just his. You have to say his or her all the time. And even in the Bible, they've changed it to God, He or She. It's no longer He because they want gender equality. But Prabhupada pointed out there's a, there's a basic fallacy in this. That there is, a, there is a one basic difference between men and women that however much you try to make them the same, they'll never be the same, is that women give birth. They carry the child. Actually, it's a joint effort, but it is the woman in the woman's body, the child grows and is born, and by the arrangement of nature, the woman's body gives food to the child. So, 
Men don't do that. So as Prabhupada pointed out, you want to make equal in all respects and free rights and then you have women can just, men and women can mix up freely and doesn't matter, matter about marriage and you can try a few, try out a few men before you decide which one you want to get married and even after you get married, if you don't like him, you can dump him and get another one. So this is the modern outlook, but it's based on foolishly overlooking the fact, as Prabhupada said, that the wife is left with the child. So you say free sex, but then who's looking after the baby? The wife, because the wife, or because the mother has to look after the child by the arrangement of nature. So she has to be looked after. But in the modern age, they, the government gives money to the mother and they have some creche or kindergarten. So it's all, a, but it, it, it overlooks the children's need to, emotional, psychological need to have a father and a mother. They don't have a father or rather they have a series of fathers, means his, the mother's boyfriends or first, second, third, fourth husband. And uh, the mother also, they, they, they're not with the mother, they're at some kindergarten and then, and then they're at school and then they're at... Uh, then they come home the mother's not there because she's late from work or she's off with her boyfriend or something. And then they, there's no f fresh, no food given with love by the mother. Now they don't bother with home cooking because what does it matter? You can get from the shop or you can get take something out of the freezer and stick it in the microwave but there's no love in the food mother feeds the family it's not just feeding food but it's feeding affection also here the, the word is given we'll see also Vishrambhina in the next verse and Pritya the word is given in this verse with affection so on one side the sadhus they see that this material affection is binding us in this material world. But on the other hand, if there's no, if there's no even uh, semblance of material affection for children when they're growing up, then they won't believe in any affection. What to speak of Krishna's affection? They'll just become murderers. Or, and this is what's happening. It's quite common in the Western countries, which Indian is, India is so crazy to follow after the Western countries without considering what the effect will be. But it's quite common to have gangs of children, 12 or 13 years old, and not just boys, but girls also, going around and killing people. What for? Fun! And whatever's in their pocket. Mostly people don't have much money in their pocket these days because money is a plastic card. But they just kill them for fun. It's not unusual. It's because they have no affection in their life. So they, they, they don't get any, there's no happiness in family life. There is no family. There's a family means father, mother, at least, that's the minimum. Father, mother and children. But most children grow up without seeing or knowing their father because they're all divorced. So, so different to Vedic culture. Because Vedic culture is based on the understanding that human life is meant for God realization. But not everyone is ready to be a sadhu immediately. No, not everyone is fit for renunciation. And plus, also, one consideration is that even if one is a sadhu, there are also so many females who need looking after. So a man may accept several wives, that is Vedic culture, if he can maintain. He she may accept several wives, not necessarily for the sake of fulfilling his lust, but for the sake of protecting young girls who need to be protected by their husband. So it's, nowadays they say, well, that's very wrong. But we find that all the 
It was very common. All the great kings, Vasudev, father of Krishna, Krishna himself. There's so many examples. They had many wives. They protected them. And in the modern age, they know only one. And in the meantime, you're having girlfriends and then divorcing, getting another wife. Instead of divorcing and getting another wife, just keep the wife and have another one. If, if that propensity is there, it's better, isn't it? Of course, you may say it's not so good, but then uh, the question comes, who will protect? If, if, if the women in society are not protected, then definitely there will be a class of prostitutes. Without arranging for that, then they'll be, then if, if there's says an arrangement for young women to be married, then they'll be looking for men, one way or another. So they'll drag men away from their wives. So the whole Vedic system, they should be married young, before puberty, but this is illegal in India now, because they have a different concept that, well, we have to think, what, what the child themselves likes to do, but they don't know what to do. They, they, they want, uh, I, I want to marry the man I love, but then you find the man you love, after five years you don't love him anymore. Because the idea of love is based on sense gratification. So the Western idea is, first you fall in love, then you get married. The Indian system is, first you get married, and then afterwards love, Come, it comes afterwards. Because that's based on, just like it says here, Parya Charat Pritya, affectionate service. So the, the Indian system is, they're married. The boy may be five and the girl two. And then when the girl gets a little bit older, five, six, she starts going to the boy's house and serving him food like that. She knows this is my husband. And then, uh, and he knows this is my wife, well they don't have much idea about what it is, because they're children after all, but this, I mean, from the beginning serving, and then he, beca then, uh, he becomes in indebted, and she becomes attached, and they become attached, and they, ne they, never in they never think of running off to this prostitute, that prostitute, boyfriend, girlfriend, and all this kind of thing. So it's a very good culture. Science, it's designed by Krishna himself, but in the modern age they, they think this is all very bad, we have to be like in the West. And, and nowadays in, in India it's just, to even a few years ago divorce was considered something very bad, but now it's just normal. And that children have severe psychological problems, that's also considered normal, and no one stops to think why. Why? Because you, know, you have adopted the demoniac way of life, which is the, the ethos or the, the basis of modern society is that everyone should enjoy their senses as much as possible. And civilization is a social system by which everyone uh, lives together and with competition, some, some, a lot of element of competition and to some extent cooperation, everyone enjoys their senses as much as possible, with some limits. I mean, it's still illegal to kill people for pleasure, although some people have started to do that. There are some limits, but they're taking away the limits as much as possible. Just like, because now, here we're talking about Sadvi, she's serving her husband. So, first comes service, that uh, sex is there also. In marriage that's understood, sex is there, but that's not the emphasis. The emphasis is the husband takes care of the wife, the wife serves the husband, and they mutually cooperate to serve Krishna. But nowadays the emphasis is only on sex. And sex any way you like it. So now we have homosexual marriages in the church <laughs> because they don't know what the purpose of human life is. They don't know what the purpose of human life is and therefore it's a complete madhouse. 
I mean, even in the Western world where they're beef eaters, until, a rec until recently, homosexuality was considered sinful and illegal. But nowadays, in the same countries, it is illegal to speak against homosex. And they're making by law that if you, if you have, they want to make laws that if you have a church or any place where they conduct religious marriages, then you have to conduct for homosexuals also. So, this is modern life. And even in ISKCON, some of our top leaders want to introduce this. They think it's very good we should have homosexual marriages because they're bewildered. They don't know what the... They're, they're bewildered about how to live in human society according to the Varnashram principles. So what a disaster in human society. Actually, it means that this modern civilization, it's, it's finished. I mean, there never was any real civilization. But when, it, when a society becomes decadent, then it loses any strength. Decadent means morally totally degraded. So they lose their strength. It's, it's just like the Roman Empire went on for so many, several centuries. But when they became totally decadent, then they didn't have any strength to fight. If you're only interested in, in having lots of sex and enjoying the senses, then there's no discipline and how can you, how can you fight? So they were over, the Roman Empire was overcome by, by uh, what they called barbarians. So uh, the, the British also, they, had, uh, they, they were Christians. So they, with the idea of Christianizing the world, they, they went and they expanded their empire. And it was actually, the British Empire's strength, Prabhupada explained, was based on the Indian troops. Because somehow more by, more by political diplomacy, they, the British were able to rule, to take over the rulership of India. But they, they, then they engaged, especially the Gurkhas, and the Jats and the Sikhs. Sikhs means mostly they're from Jat background. And the Marathas, these were the, these are special, the, the Sikhs, Jats, Gurkhas and Marathas. So these are the best or famous fighting people of India, Kshatriyas. They have in other places, there must be Telugu Kshatriyas also. In Gujarat also they have Jadeja, but mostly the uh, these people are famous for fighting. So it was with the Indian troops that the British were able to maintain their empire. So when they couldn't hold India, they knew that we can't hold our empire. And they, they had to let it go. Because they, they had some uh, people by following moral principles. They get some strength by discipline. Now the American army, they can't fight. They're going on by technology. By, by, by technological strength, they're able to fight. Otherwise, if, they had to, if it was just man to man, in Iraq, the Americans wouldn't have a hope. In Afghanistan, Iraq, I mean, even they're having a hard time, even with all their technology. But they, they don't have the, the strength to fight because they're dissolute, which means they don't... They're, they're, they're always intoxicated and having sex left, right and center. So they don't, they don't have any moral strength to fight. They don't get the determination, actually. The American Army, Navy, Air Force, they're just it's full of intoxication. They're all taking drugs here, there and everywhere. So this society, actually, it can't stand. It's already doomed. It's a matter of time. It cannot stay. But in the meantime, it looks very good. If you go to America, even though two big buildings have fallen down, but there's still there are so many big buildings and freeways and turnpikes with big cars going on them, and still America looks very powerful, but it's all very fragile. None of these empires last very long. The Roman Empire lasted a few hundred years, and then... There was Egyptian, Babylonian Empire. Iraq was the seat of a great empire. 
British Empire. As Prabhupada said, in our childhood we heard the saying that the sun never sets on the British Empire. You know that saying? Because it was all over the world, so somewhere in the British Empire the sun is shining. And Prabhupada said, I came to Britain and I found that the sun is never shining in Britain. <laughs> it's, it's all in Br Britain's famous for being cloudy. All clouds. Also in, in London, one of my god sisters out of the class, Krishna Vesha. I saw her recently. She asked Prabhupada after the class that Prabhupada is Bhagavad Gita spoken on the hellish planets? Prabhupada said, I'm speaking Bhagavad Gita here in London. Is not hellish enough for you? <laughs> so Prabhupada found the, the great British Empire, London, to be inco inconsequential also when he first saw the River Thames because the, they turned out the River Thames, the greatest river in England, Prabhupada so said, it looks like a little canal. There's only a little, it's only a tiny, you see any big, so many big rivers in India, Krishna, Godavari, what is it, Ganga, Kaveri, Tishta, so many big rivers are there. And this little river, it's it just like you can almost jump over it, it's such a small river. And but there was, oh wow, great river Thames. So, so all these empires, they're all, everything in this material world is temporary, but definitely when people become dissolute and decadent, which means fallen down from any moral principles, then it, they cannot last, cannot stay long, because who will fight? People have no, they have, they have no courage to fight. Ultimately, all these empires are maintained by fighting. That's, <laughs> who, is, who will have the courage? Who will have the determination? And what for? People are saying, what for? If you have pride in your country, then you'll want to fight for it. But who can be proud of, of, of being a member of a society that's front door, back door, sex anyway, this way, that way? And, and then even why bother with human beings? They're animals also. Any hole will do. So, for what will they fight? They'll be overrun. So, this modern society, it's already doomed. Krishna consciousness is the only hope. Prabhupada said this movement will go down in history for having saved humankind in its darkest hour. Well, it's getting darker. Prabhupada said that and that was how long ago? 30 years ago. And in the meantime, how much degradation has been there? Even more. These are mean times and getting worse. India, it's just so horrible now. How horrible India is becoming. Here we're talking Sadvi, chaste wife. Where is that, where is that chaste woman? Now in the colleges, it's just all boyfriend, girlfriend, kissing, abortion. Horrible situation. So the Krishna conscious movement is the only hope, really. There's no hope for human society, otherwise it's just so degraded. We can't see what is the bottom of their degradation. But we also have to see that what is the Krishna Consciousness Movement? At the present time, within our movement, there's a lot of moves to try to make this movement in line with modern society. But in line with modern society means all marching to hell. So Prabhupada is giving a completely different outlook on life, how human life should be lived. We don't know how to live as human beings. But we think we'll, we'll go along with the Western way of life and still be devotees. But it doesn't work very well. Because the Western way of life is demoniac. We think that, well, we can have the 
we can have homosexual Vaishnavas and and it's all okay everything's nice they're also human beings yeah they can they can be devotees they just have to stop being homosexual that's all. To, no practicing no publicizing if people with homosexual tendencies want to become devotees they can become but they can't practice because once you do that's sinful dhamavi ruddho kamosmi what is that dhamavi ruddho bhuto smi what is that what is it I'm forgetting kamavi ruddho bhute sorry I just came off the train yeah kamosmi bharatasha Krishna says I am that sex life which is not contrary to religious principles but homosex means it must be contrary to religious principles so there's no one can be a homosexual and they should just not no practice then you can be a devotee otherwise it's grossly sinful now we may say oh, why are we discussing these things it's like very gross to discuss but these are issues facing our society at the present time and it's going to come more and more that the demoniac society will want us to live according to their rules it's coming in the western world like I say you can't you can't have a marriage hall unless you let it out to, these rules are coming that you can let it out to anyone who wants to get married if two men want to get married it's nonsense marriage the marriage means man and woman not man and man or woman and woman but now they've they've redefined what marriage means and uh, they're going to make rules you cannot you're not allowed to have a marriage hall unless you allow homosexuals to marry also. And that will come to our ISKCON also. And within ISKCON they're also pushing that this should be allowed publicly, shamelessly, pushing these things. So, what is the hope? The hope is that we have to understand what Prabhupada says and what Guru, Sadhu and Shastra say and follow that very carefully. Now, even among our devotees, I'm telling, many times I tell, you see, your, your daughter's already 15, 16, when are you going to get her married? I say, no, 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 they have to go through college, this, that. I said, but this wasn't what Prabhupada recommended. No, no, but this, it's different now. They don't care what Prabhupada says at all. And in the meantime, in the college, their boyfriend, girlfriend, abortion, all this kind of thing is going on. And they say, oh, I have to have my daughter, she has to be educated educated what? They have to cook idli, dosa, or look after the children. And what's a woman's, the body is meant for looking after children. But that they also don't want. Children, hamdo hamare ek. That's a, you don't want children. Children are also another nuisance. The woman has to have a career and have a, become a head in society and so many wrong ideas. Who's ready to accept what Prabhupada says? On everything. Sarva metad ritang manye yang mang vadesikation. So now they've invented a philosophy that, well, we accept what Prabhupada says on spiritual things, but not on material things. Prabhupada never spoke on material things. His, mat his advice for living in this material world is wholly based on Krishna's advice. So it's spiritual. It's his. Prabhupada is giving the spiritual formula how to live in this material world to get out of it, not to become more entangled in it. So in this way we become invo involved in Guru Avagya, thinking him an ordinary person whose advice is not very, not very uh, suitable, or I know better, considering him an ordinary man. He had his opinion, I have my opinion. So these are all very dangerous. So just like we can see if, a, if the materialistic society becomes decadent, then it becomes finished. So similarly, in a religious society, if they become decadent and allow sinful activities, also finished. So just like Christianity, useless, because they, well, they went against their guru. They, they, they made him, they, they, deified him he never said I'm God but they in, 
misinterpreted him as God and they redefined his life history to make him into a meat eater so they could eat meat. And in this way Christianity was redefined and became a religious excuse for materialism. So in the same way if we don't want to accept Guru Mukha Padmavaka Chite Te Kore Aika Ana Kore Homoyasha if we want to redefine and change what Prabhupada said and, and just in the name of time, place and circumstance or whatever just do whatever we like then it will become like Christianity. Christianity means you put a picture of Jesus or you put a crucifix and you say Jesus I believe in you and then you do whatever you like. So we also we put a picture of Prabhupada and say Jai Prabhupada, Jai Prabhupada and then just do whatever we like. Then we become useless. Asa. Acharya Jai Mat Shai Mat Asha Shai Shai Mat Lange Chale Shai To Asha What the Acharya has given us that is to be followed. And if we don't follow it we just do whatever we like then we become useless. So these things we should consider very seriously. These things are not very popular. If we discuss, even though it's right there in the Bhagavatam, if we discuss sadvi, saintly woman means chaste and faithful to her husband, this is not very popular in the world in general and increasingly so in Iskon also because I have to have my career says the young girl. So, but this is what Prabhupada taught and as far as I'm concerned, I'm going to go on teaching it also, even if no one wants to listen or even if I'm banned from ISKCON. It's now banned in ISKCON to, to say things which things like, there's a GBC law, like you're not supposed to repeat certain sh statements from Shastra, like women are less intelligent. But if it says in Shastra, then we have to say, you may not like it, you may not under but we have to say. This intelligent Prabhupada explained means that more tendency to be more inclined to sense enjoyment. Therefore they have to be under the control of a husband. But who will preach that women have to be under the control of a husband? Who will say this? They're afraid. Prabhupada always said, Prabhupada became he was preaching this in America and they became so much propaganda against him. Prabhupada said openly to the female newspaper reporter that all the problems in society are caused because women are not submissive to men. And they wrote very bad, very bad report, very bad publicity. What can I say? I have to say, it's a fact. So you may think, well, this is anti-woman. No, the propaganda that women should not be submissive to men, that is anti-women. Because by the freedom, they become exploited by one man after another. But by taking one husband and serving him, then they become protected by one man. Otherwise, they're just used by one after the other. One after the other. So it's actually for the woman's own self-interest to adopt these principles. But they don't know. They don't want to accept. They're more intelligent. And therefore they have to suffer. Hare Krishna. Any question or comment about this? Yes. Please speak in the mic. This looks at the last uh, resort or attempt to this materialistic society. They are trying to Already so many lessons are coming. <laughs> Tsunami. Everyone is saying, oh, we're very sorry. What can we do to help? But they didn't say, why? Why this thing is happening? They're killing so many children in the womb. They're killing so many animals. They're killing so many chickens. They're having so much illicit sex. And why not tsunami? There should be tsunami every day.
Previously in India, this kind of things happens. People understand this is some karmic reaction. But no one was talking like that. Indians have lost their culture and spiritual understanding. So many poultry farms everywhere. So many millions of cows and bulls killed every year in India. And they think this is progress. Leather export, beef export. They must get sinful reactions. No, I didn't say that. Prabhupada said that. But we have to keep ISKCON as ISKCON, the way Prabhupada wanted it. Because we can't save the world if we become part of it. If we also do the same things that all the materialistic people do, then ISKCON is only a sign on the door. ISKCON is not meant to be a sign on the door. It means principles of Shastra are followed as received from the Acharyas. There should be, there must be, a great difference between inside Iskon temple and outside. At least at the pre outside, we eventually want to make the whole world Iskon. But in the present materialistic society, there should be a noticeable difference between outside Iskon and inside. And there should be a noticeable difference between everyone else and Iskon devotees. But if there's no real difference, then what is our mission? If Iskon devotees are just the same as everyone else, they're interested in Korea and making my son into a doctor instead of me. More interested in making your son into a doctor. And if he happens to be a devotee, okay. But not, not most interested in making him into a devotee. So if the, if the difference between Iskon devotees and everyone else is that we're vegetarian most of the time. We don't look at the biscuit packet very carefully to see what the ingredients are. So anyway, we're vegetarian and we also believe in Krishna. Then, and you know, well, uh, bad luck, I happen to get divorced a couple of times and I'm not so sure about this wife either, but anyway, we're devotees. Then what? What devotee? Devotee of Kali Yoga. <laughs> what is that? Naketila Galai Mala A A Kale Chala Shange Ek Pare Bala Pare Bala means I have someone Shange Ek Pare I have someone else's wife with me. So please distribute these books of Srila Prabhupada and we have to live by them also, not reinterpret them according to our own convenience. We have to change ourselves to live according to the principles in the books, not that we change the books to suit us. There's also a move to give footnotes in Prabhupada's books to explain all the different things that the Kamis might not like. <laughs> yeah, there's another question. Please come forward and see the mic. I can't understand what's being said. What's he saying? He's talking about a couple. Yeah. Yeah, she should go on serving him and help him to become Krishna conscious gradually as best she can. There's no prescription in Shastra for divorce, although it's allowed in the modern age. I have personal experience of 
Several women have come to me and told, oh, my husband's so bad, this, that. And I told, anyway, you serve him and don't get angry and we just gradually try to change. And usually the problem comes worse when they become angry. But if, they, if they're very... This is the way, according to Shastra and tradition, is very sweet, serves him nicely and gradually tries to change him. In the case of Prabhupada's sister, she was also his god-sister. And all her life she served her husband who was a flesh eater and may have had some other bad habits also. She went on all life like that. And towards the end of his life he realized, actually my wife is very saintly. Otherwise if we say, oh your husband's bad, then you kick him in the head and give him up. Then, uh, just like here, Prabhupada says that the, the, the quality like Devahuti is very rare. But that doesn't mean we should give up the ideal. Uh, not, you see, every husband's not going to be perfect. Most are not going to be perfect. But still, the street dharma has to be followed. Otherwise, uh, that's what they do. They find some little excuse and then divorce. Take the mic. Uh, that's not necessarily true. One may follow the principles, but illicit desires may still be there. We follow the principles with the idea that by following them we can gradually be freed. It's not that if you just start following the principles that all bad desires immediately go away. Yeah, yeah. So you are saying that we respond out so this is okay. So what what would be the cause? what are the causes? Well uh, I think people are not reading Prabhupada's books, they're probably watching T V or reading Time magazine or something like this because these ideas don't come from Prabhupada's books they come from Kami society or another thing they're doing is going to Kami universities and listening all day to Kami professors that's another major cause of all this contamination entering our movement they're not instead of hearing from the pure devotees they're hearing from people who have a completely different outlook on life that's a major cause the contamination in our society. know which books to read and which not books not to read. Well, we, Prabhupada's books are the basis of our movement. But Prabhupada also wanted his disciples to write books. He personally told me to. And uh, that will go on because writing is kirtan. But there are some books which are circulated in ISKCON which I wouldn't recommend anyone to read for the benefit of their Krishna conscience. So I have a rule for my disciples. If you want to read a book, ask me first. And there are some books by my godbrothers which I tell don't read. And I, they're not strictly following. Well, even it may be 90% good, but the 10% is a, that's enough to mislead you. Back to Godhead also, there's time to time some very strange things come. One lady was telling her life story, how she came to devotional service, and one short paragraph comes up that in 1970-something I divorced my husband. He was a nice man, but not very spiritual. So I thought he was an obstacle in my spiritual life, and I divorced him. The next paragraph. So, 
or showing all young boys and girls mixing up, going on some bus tour. And what is this? So, I don't recommend it. <laughs> because it, it's 95 or 98 percent may be good, but then it, the 2 percent, they get the wrong impression. These opera sampradayas, many of them, they do, they do kirtan, they chant Hare Krishna, they do all good, good things, but some little thing, apparently little thing, they think Chaitanya Mahaprabhu is the enjoyer of the women of Nadia, and they're totally rejected. So we don't need magazines in, in India showing the, how the Western young boys and girls are all mixing up together without any restriction. Rather, the, the, the ISKCON should bring the pure traditional Indian culture and introduce that to the West rather than through ISKCON the contaminated Western culture should come and spoil the Indians. We got it back to front. So you probably don't have this kind of thing discussed in the classes much or even if at all. But but nowadays I'm discussing these things very publicly and openly because these things are going on publicly and openly. Just like Bhakti Godhead, it's publicly distributed. And if no one says anything, then you'll think, well, that's okay. That all the young, it's okay in Krishna Conscious for young boys and girls to mix up and no restrictions. And it's okay to divorce your husband if you don't think he's very spiritual. It's publicly, public propaganda is going on Kali's propaganda is going on publicly within ISKCON, so unless someone says something against it, then everyone will think that this is what ISKCON stands for. This is acceptable. So yes, Kali has entered through the, through the front door. <laughs> So, uh, yes, please read Prabhupada's books very carefully and understand there are so many people saying so many things. We should understand by the measure of what Prabhupada has taught us. And even if someone is a, has the designation guru in ISKCON, if they don't speak according to what Prabhupada speaks, then be careful. The only qualification to be a guru in ISKCON is to follow what Prabhupada has given us, isn't it? So if you don't do that, then you're not fit to be good. Anything else? All right. Hare Krishna. All glory.